Here's the problem. A block of mass 0 0.600 kilograms is attached to a spring along a horizontal surface and stretched to a maximum displacement delta x of 0 0.130 meters in the positive x direction and let go. If the force constant of the spring k is 130 newtons per meter and we could ignore the effects of friction, we have two questions. The first one, what is the magnitude and direction of the force applied to the block? This means the force applied by the spring to the block. And B, what is the magnitude and direction of the acceleration of the block? So it's quite simple. You have a situation, they literally uh, tell you have a mass, uh, a block of mass m, which is given, a spring constant that's known, and you pull, it's attached to a spring, and you pull it a certain distance away and, you'll, and, and then you let it go. What is the force at that moment that the spring is exerting on the block? And secondly, what does that force cause? What acceleration does it actually impart onto the block? Because you know you're going to let it go and it's going to fly back and then go back and then go back, 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 and eventually it's going to settle back in the middle. But what is that initial acceleration once you, uh, just at that moment that you let it go? So, as always, we draw a picture. So, uh, what we have uh, in this situation um, is we have a um, wall, let's call it, like this, and we're going to draw our spring right here, and we're going to connect it to some mass m, which we actually know what it is. It's uh, 0 0.600 kilograms, right? And we also know the k constant of the spring, which is 130 newtons per meter, all right? Now, we know that this spring has a shortened equilibrium position, right? I'm just going to mark it here somewhere. I don't really know exactly where it is. Let's just say it's right here. And the distance that this, uh, b this block was pulled beyond this equilibrium position was 0 0.130 meters. Um, and we call that distance delta x, right? That's the displacement there. So we, in other words, we're stretching the spring to the right beyond its equilibrium position. This is the equilibrium position right here. So we call it equilibrium position. If we were to squish the spring this way, then it would be in compression. Here is an expansion right here. Now, before we actually solve the problem, let's just think about it a little bit. This is why another reason why springs are so important. There's a lot of things in the universe in engineering and science that behave with an inherent springiness. Let's think about it before we solve this at all and, and, and see how we could exp explore how this might be used in other branches of engineering. So here is where the spring normally is. We pull it this way, and we know there's going to be a force acting backwards from the spring. We know there's got to be some force, and we know it has to be going this direction. This is going to be the F spring, right? Because we know that the spring force always tries to pull everything back to the equilibrium position. But what's going to happen is when you let it go, it's going to accelerate this direction, and is it going to stop right here at the equilibrium position? No, because this thing has momentum and inertia, right? So it's going to overshoot. And what's going to happen is it's going to go over here. And what happens when you start flying past the neutral position? You start compressing the spring. So then the spring will start to push this way. It'll start pushing back again. It'll stop, turn around, and it'll go this way again, flying through the center. And then it'll go here. And then the process will continue over and over again. And I know that you've all seen a spring uh, hanging there, the grocery store or whatever, and you pull on it and let it go, and a boing, 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 boing. The reason it has that motion, that periodic motion, is because as the mass gets to either end of the extreme, the force from the spring changes direction, pushes to the center, changes direction, pushes to the center, changes direction, pushes it to the center. Now, if the spring were perfect with no friction, this would literally happen forever. But the spring itself has friction internally to itself, and so eventually you're going to uh, you're going to dissipate that energy, and you're going to settle down and stop moving entirely. What I'm trying to get at is that even though it might seem boring to study springs, you might you might uh, you might guess that. Uh, let's talk about a skyscraper, a very tall building. It's different than a spring. I know it is different, but there is a springiness of the materials that that skyscraper is built of, right? Um, it's long beams all the way from the top, all the way down to the bottom. And when you bend a the beam, there's a springiness. It's a different kind of spring than this, but if you just 
if you just take a, a metal rod and try to bend it and let it go, it's gonna go boy, oh, 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 it's gonna do this because of the springiness. It's trying to push it back to the center, trying to push it back to the center. So you can model the dynamics of things that have springiness, even if they don't look like springs, you can model them with Hooke's Law. So we can use these kinds of things. This is a very simple approximation, but you can use this kind of idea to model how things might sway, bridges, uh, buildings, even wings on an airplane. If, if you ever look at an airplane wing, when you're actually going through turbulence, it's the wings are bouncing. There is springiness in those wings because there's a wing spar that goes all the way through and it's a big, very strong piece of metal, but it has springiness. So when you, when something pushes the wing down, it, it tries to, the, the springiness kicks in and it pushes it back up and you get this oscillation going on. So springs are really important for all kinds of structures, not just for studying springs, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Now let's get back to the problem itself. The problem says, what's the magnitude of the force right here? So we, this is straight out of what is Hooke's law. The force is equal to negative K. We usually write negative KX, but we could write it as negative K delta X. This is just the, the change in the position of the spring. I mean, you can write it as delta X, meaning you've you've pulled it. And so what you have here is negative K being 130. And the distance uh, is going to the right. So the, the delta X is actually a positive number because it's moving to the right, which these are positive values of X. And it is in meters, 0 0.130 meters, right? And so when you take uh, 130 and you multiply it by 0 0.130, you get 16.9. However, you got a negative sign here, so it's negative 16.9 and this is Newtons. Now, why does it make sense that it comes out in Newtons? Because the spring constant of 130, the units were Newtons per meter. And the, and the actual distance, uh, was this was essentially multiplied by meters because it was in meters. So the meters cancel and the resulting unit you get back is Newtons here. So the spring constant is telling you that if I did pull it a meter, it would give me 130 Newtons of force. However, I didn't pull it a meter, I pulled it much less than that. So it cuts that number down and tells you how much it's pushing back. And so the negative sign means the force is not acting in the direction of the pull, the force is acting opposite of the pull negative 16.9 meters, and I'm gonna to say to the left. That's what the negative sign implies. It means to the left. All right, part B. It says, uh, what is the magnitude and the direction of the acceleration of the block? Okay, so when I let it go, the force of the spring tends to accelerate because F equals MA, right? So for part B, we just use F equals MA. The only force in the X direction here is the spring force. We already know what that force is. It's a negative number. It's negative 16.9, and that is in Newtons, right? And the mass of the block is given to us is 0 0.600 kilograms, and so let's just solve for the acceleration. So the acceleration is gonna be negative 16.9 divided by the 0.6 to get it over here, and you're gonna get negative 28.2, and the units would be meters per second squared because Newtons and kilograms, then the acceleration of the compatible unit is meters per second squared. Now, what does this mean? This is uh, acceleration like any acceleration, but because we have a negative sign, it means it's, it's to the left. In other words, we pull the thing to the right, the spring force is acting this way, we let it go, the acceleration is negative, which means it's accelerating in this, in this direction. And it is going to continue accelerating, accelerating eventually until it starts compressing that spring again, it's gonna turn around and go back the other way and start doing its, its uh, uh, periodic motion over and over again. So this is a simpler problem. It's more of a plug in and you know see the you know, pl plug and chug kind of problem and just use the equations. But we have to crawl before we can walk and we just want to do at least some to show you which direction. I think with Hooke's Law, it's mostly understanding the direction. Why is there a negative there? What's positive? What's negative? That's really a big skill. So solve this one yourself. Pretty sm simple, small problem. Follow me on to the next lesson. We'll continue to work with Hooke's Law. Learn anything at mathandscience.com.